It's Adam here for PC Monitors and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the Philips 328P6VUBREB or as I like to call it the 328P6 VUBREB which is somehow easy to remember. As usual this video accompanies a more detailed written review and you can find a link to that in the description of the video alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. As usual with these videos, always remember that what you see depends on my camera, it depends on the processing done by my video editing software, by YouTube, and ultimately depends on your own monitor. So in no way does what you see represent how this monitor actually looks first hand. The monitor features a 31.5 inch VA panel, um, or more specifically it's really an AAS panel uh, as a muffle anchoring switch. Uh, which basically is just a VA type of panel and uh, very characteristically like normal vertical alignment panels. It has a 4K UHD resolution 3840 by 2160 and the screen size itself does give a nice immersive experience. It's, um, I mean it's a very personal thing really screen size and it depends how close you're actually sitting to the monitor. But for me, I find it very comfortable to use from a viewing distance of, say, 70 to 80 centimetres. Other people might find it just fine sitting closer than that, other people further away. But it certainly fills up your field of vision quite nicely. So it's a nice big screen. It also has a nice pixel density. I actually consider this kind of screen size to be somewhat optimal for the 4K UHD resolution. I don't need to use any scaling. I can quite happily get on with just 100% scaling in Windows so everything's just the normal size uh, but if you do happen to use some scaling you might find you can get away with less scaling than on smaller UHD models so that's a nice benefit and you still benefit from the nice clarity and the sharpness potential offered by this good pixel density. So it does give a nice sort of sharp look to things, a nice level of clarity and detail for text, for images when you're playing games at suitable resolutions, especially when they've got high resolution textures, it all looks very nice. And I've got plenty of written content on the website that explores that in more detail. And there's a sort of little summary of that kind of experience in the written review of this model as well. So you get loads of on-screen real estate, great for uh, productivity purposes or procrastination purposes, whatever you happen to be doing. You can have a, a website open, a Word document with loads of information visible and it's all perfectly clear and crisp. Everything's nice and readable. So it's really good for that kind of thing as well. It's quite difficult if you come from this monitor to one with a significantly lower resolution, such as full HD. It's, uh, it's so cramped and restrictive compared to the level of real estate offered by this screen. The screen surface is medium or relatively light, depending on how you choose to classify it, matte anti-glare. So this offers good glare handling characteristics so you don't have to worry too much about ambient lighting, but as always, you should sort of moderate that as much as you can and avoid light striking the screen directly because you still can get kind of a flooded look to the image because of ambient light, too much ambient light. It also affects the clarity of the image. It has a bit of a grainy look to lighter colours. The screen surface isn't the smoothest nor the lightest I've seen, so there is a bit of a graininess to it. It's something I'm quite sensitive to. Not everyone really notices this or finds it bothersome, so just note that it is there. I'm now going to talk about the external features of the monitor. As you can see, it doesn't have the most elegant or modern looking design. It has moderately thick bezels, they're sort of single stage bezels, so you don't get much visible panel border. The panel border is pretty much covered by the physical bezel itself, matte black plastic. The bottom bezel is a bit thicker. It also has a metallic finish to this sort of stripe with the Philips logo in the middle. And it has the OSD controls down there, which are explored in a separate video, the OSD video. The stand base is relatively deep. It's got quite a big sort of, quite a thick profile if you prefer. It has a fairly chunky stand neck as well, silver matte plastic with a cable tidy loop there in the middle. The monitor is reasonably thin from the side. It has sort of a thinner section which goes straight down, then there's a sort of bulky boxy section in the middle, and it goes further back where the stand attaches centrally as well. The included stand offers full ergonomic flexibility, 
So you can tilt the monitor back a bit, you can tilt it forwards a little bit, you can also swivel it left and right, and you can pivot it into portrait 90 degrees clockwise. At the rear, matte black plastic dominates. There's a light grey coloured Philips logo towards the top. The central region, you can see the stand attachment point. The stand attaches by 100 by 100 millimeter VESA, and you can instead remove that and attach the screen to an alternative VESA compatible solution if you prefer. At the top, there are some upfiring speakers and they're explored in the written review a bit. They just give a, a reasonable sound output, nothing incredible, but it's not quite as tinny as some integrated speakers either. Towards the left side is an AC power input, and that means that the monitor has an internal power converter rather than an external power brick. And there is a zero watt power switch, which cuts off the power to the monitor completely if you want to do that. Around the other side, there are the remaining ports of the monitor, so the main ports of the monitor. These include two HDMI 2.0 ports, DisplayPort 1.4, USB Type-C 3.1 with DisplayPort alternate mode. There is an Ethernet port, and there are four USB 3 ports. And the second set there have fast charging capabilities as well. And there is a 3.5mm headphone jack. I'm now running Shadow of the Tomb Raider and I'm going to talk about the contrast performance of the monitor. Contrast is really one of the main strengths of VA models like this and this model does indeed have strong static contrast. So what that means is that darker elements, and this game has plenty of darker elements, sort of dark interiors from caves, tombs, caverns, that kind of thing. So the sort of scene I'm in at the moment has plenty of dark elements to it. There are also brighter elements which stand out nicely in the surrounding darkness, such as these flames here, various little light sources, light streaming in from outside as well. So that all looks quite nice and atmospheric, but I, I do try to set people's expectations. If you're in a dark room as I am now, just to sort of highlight these strengths and weaknesses a bit better, then it doesn't really give you an inky depth. It doesn't have extremely strong contrast. It's not like an OLED or anything like that. I would recommend some lighting in the room. Don't expect to sit in a dark room and have everything look beautiful, deep and inky, because that's not the kind of experience you're gonna get. And to be honest, that's not really the experience you're gonna get from any sort of LCD on the market these days. Um, certainly not an SDR anyway. The Lighter elements like this also have a bit of graininess. I mentioned that with the screen surface earlier. And again, that's something I'm sensitive to. Not everyone really minds about that. Another issue with this model is it has black crush. And that's something that VA models often have. And it happens to various degrees depending on the gamma behavior. And what it means is that some subtle details are actually lost. And that's because from a sort of direct viewing position when he's sitting in front of the monitor or as the camera is positioned now. If you look at the central areas of the screen, some shades actually appear darker than they should and they essentially blend into black. And it's very difficult to capture this accurately on the camera and what you'll see will depend on your own monitor ultimately. But um, this model does have a moderate amount of this black crush. It's more than I've seen on models of this kind of size and panel type that I've used recently such as the curved Samsung SVA panels used on the Asus XG32VQ, for example, and also the LG 32GK850G and F. They have a bit less black crush than this model. It's not exactly extreme, but it does mask a bit of the detail. So some of the subtle details on this rock face, um, it's not actually that bad on this particular example, but some of the more subtle details, the much darker details in the rock face, are actually quite well masked, more masked than they should be. If you view those elements towards the edge of the screen, and again, this isn't really gonna work on the video, but if you view them towards the edge of the screen, or indeed you shift your position, so you're looking at things from off angle or a more extreme angle. So if I move the camera, you can kind of see the detail levels change a bit. Being a VA panel, it does have a bit of VA glow and you can see this most noticeably towards the corners of the screen, but there's actually a very small amount of that on this model. So it's not really obvious at all, even in much darker scenes like this, 
You can kind of see it a bit if you're sitting in a dark room, but it's not extreme. And if you compare it to IPS glow uh, that IPS type panels have, it's really very subtle indeed. And I've certainly seen more of this on some VA models of this kind of size, particularly the curved models. So this model doesn't really have a problem with VA glow. And if you think about TN panels, they've got a kind of gradient running up and down the screen. So towards the bottom, darker shades appear significantly lighter than they should, and that kind of gives a flooded look to dark areas. And towards the top of the screen, you get a massive masking of detail. Things look much deeper than they should, perceived gamma's much higher. So the consistency on this model in that respect is much better. I'm now going to talk about colour reproduction, and to start off, I like to look at the Legom tests for viewing angles, so that's legom.nl, the website, and this can be used to highlight weaknesses in viewing angle performance and colour consistency in a way that's very obvious, and maybe more obvious than other sort of normal use of the monitor. The Legom text here, you can see that it should look, at, ideally it would look a sort of blended grey throughout, but there's actually kind of transition between green and orange and, and slightly red striping. So there's sort of green further up, red towards the bottom. And this all shifts very readily as you move your head or as I move the camera. And there's actually a kind of cone in the centre of the screen where it's more blended. And that's quite typical for a VA model. And this relates to the perceived gamma shifts and the gamma behaviour. And it also is the kind of thing that causes this black crush, as I mentioned before. So perceived gamma is very different comparing different areas of the of the panel and also as you change your viewing position. You can also see this effect with solid colours. So the purple block here, if my camera would just focus, the purple block here, I don't know what this is going to look like on the video, but towards the bottom it looks quite an obvious pink hue. Towards the top, and particularly the top central region, it's more of a kind of violet colour. This pink hue also shifts very readily according to head movement. The red block, it's a bit more consistent, but it's a very vibrant red for the most part, but it's actually a bit more of a sort of pink hue further down. I should also mention, if you are sitting closer to the monitor, or you're or standing close to the monitor, the pink hue, the bloom of pink, is more extreme, more noticeable. If you're further back, then things look a bit more consistent. The green block is a fairly solid green throughout, but again, there's a bit of a yellow towards the, the bottom. It's less saturated towards the bottom and also towards the, the edges of the screen. I should also mention the sort of differences you're seeing here. I'm going to talk about this using in-game examples in a little bit, but the Differences are quite typical for VA models to, to see this kind of shift in saturation towards the edges and bottom of the screen. But they're actually more pronounced on this model than they are on other models I've tested recently with this panel type and this kind of size. And again, I'll talk about this with in-game examples very shortly. I'm now running Battlefield 1 and I'm going to talk about colour reproduction using in-game examples. The monitor has generous extension beyond the sRGB colour gamut. It actually covers most of the DCI P3 colour space and this is the target colour gamut for HDR. Now for SDR content such as this game as I'm running at the moment without HDR enabled or sort of your average game it's really designed with the sRGB colour space in mind so what that means is you get some extra saturation or as some users would consider it extra vibrancy compared to models which more accurately track the sRGB colour space without such extension beyond it. So it gives a nice saturated look to the image. The sky, for example, has some quite eye-catching blue shades. The sand here, the desert, it looks more kind of slightly more of a red hue than it should. It should look more of a neutral brown colour than it does, but that's because it does have a slight red hue to it anyway, and this is just enhanced by the colour gamut. Some users really like this look, the extra saturation. Um, it also gives some nice sort of golden green colours as well for the vegetation here. But the variety is maintained in a way that it isn't if you simply use digital saturation enhancement. For example, if you use NVIDIA Digital Vibrance, because that doesn't alter the colour gamut itself. It just pulls shades towards the edge of the colour gamut, making things more saturated. But as you take them close to the edge of the gamut without expanding the gamut itself, you lose the variety, you crush shades together. So this looks very different to that. 
It doesn't have the cartoonish look that some models have with traditional wide gamuts, so ones that track close to Adobe RGB, for example, because they have quite skewed saturation, which is very heavy in some regions of the gamut, but not others. This has more of a sort of even boost in saturation. So things do look more saturated than they should, but it's kind of more even and then more of a natural look is maintained. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of sort of the muted shades actually do look relatively muted compared to the shades which are supposed to look more vibrant. The, there again, there are some weaknesses in colour consistency. So you lose some saturation towards the edge of the screen. Things are a bit more saturated centrally. Even towards the edge of the screen, I wouldn't really describe things as looking washed out. But if I compare to the curved Samsung SVA models, such as the Asus XG32VQ, and also the LG 32850G and F, which use flat VA panels, then the colour consistency of this isn't as good, it is weaker. So, and these shifts as well, also when you, when you move your head uh, relative to the screen even slightly, you can kind of see these shifts in saturation. I'm now running the monitor in HDR and the game in HDR. And the first thing people sometimes notice when they run a game like Battlefield 1 in HDR is that, oh, things look kind of washed out, they might say. Uh, but that's actually because the colour gamut, which is close to DCI P3, things are actually being mapped appropriately to it now, so you don't get that kind of oversaturation that you do with just normal SDR content. The game developers have a much bigger gamut to play with and they can map things accurately to that. So it actually makes things look more realistic, more believable, and you get excellent variety and, and in terms of saturation levels as well. So the sky, for example, looks more natural now, a bit more muted, but still looks quite vibrant. Again, the uh, sort of red hue to the sand is now curtailed to a good degree. It has a nice rich golden look to it, but it still again looks vibrant and, and more natural, more as it should. But the game developers can put in saturated shades where they want. These greens as well are actually deeper and in some ways more lush than they were before. And there's more of a kind of golden, deep green to some of these patches of vegetation rather than a kind of overdone yellowish green hue to them. So things just look more natural. And there's the sort of red in the background for that flag and fire, although you can't see any at the moment. It looks a nice vibrant orange. So the developers can definitely put more vibrant shades in when they want them. It's just that things look more natural overall. The other aspect of HDR, there are a couple of other aspects of HDR, um, and I'm actually going to use Tomb Raider as an example to talk about this, and obviously contrast is one key area of HDR. I'm now on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm going to talk about other advantages to the HDR experience. The HDR10 pipeline, which is what PC games and, and typically console games will use, this calls for 10-bit colour reproduction, or at least 10 bits per channel. So the monitor or the GPU, ideally both, will support 10-bit colour processing. In this case, the monitor does indeed support 10-bit colour processing. And with HDR, things are all mapped very carefully to that big gamut with, with great precision. So with HDR, you sort of get a great precision with both dark and light shades. For darker shades, you actually get more distinct details. And as I've mentioned before, a bit of black crush. Um, obviously, that's sort of related to the viewing angle behaviour and gamma behaviour. That exists with HDR, but to quite a degree, this is actually overridden by the fact that the tones are more carefully mapped. This monitor also uses local dimming on the backlight, so it has... Philips don't actually officially specify this, but according to my testing, it has eight LED clusters down the left side of the screen and eight down the right side of the screen. And as usual for a monitor, light guides are used to make sure that you can illuminate the whole screen, not just those sections of the screen, because that would look really weird. And you essentially get 16 dimming zones. So when you combine this with the more careful tone mapping, the backlight can dim for the darker areas. Um, the tone mapping, again, with the greater precision, helps to sort of bring out these details in the darker areas. And there's a greater distinct detail in darker areas and dark shades. And for brighter shades, again, you have this kind of excellent level of distinction. So these dimming zones which cover this much brighter content, such as the light streaming in through the opening in the forest canopy there, are much brighter. 
and the peak luminance for these particular dimming zones is much greater than with the screen under its normal SDR. And because it's localized dimming, you don't get the entire screen sort of flooded with high brightness. It actually stands out really nicely um, and it gives it a much more natural look to daylight. Um, I mean, things just look sort of, rather than looking universally flooded and bright, the sort of elements that should be bright definitely do look very bright and much brighter than without HDR. So this particular element in terms of looking at the, the daylight elements and areas of light, they're really impressive in HDR. Another thing that really impressed me and actually quite literally caught my eye when I was sort of first in this scene in Tomb Raider, there's this kind of glint and um, you see the, the light from the canopy there glints onto the water. That glint is I mean, I wouldn't say it's quite like looking at sort of the reflected sun on actual water, but it has more of that kind of lifelike quality to it. It really stands out in a great way in HDR. Another thing which you won't be able to appreciate from the video either is there isn't just a sort of mass of light there. The extra precision actually helps create this kind of beautiful smooth gradient. There's a kind of hazy look um, and there are rays of sun. And again, you really can't see this properly on the video. The, it just looks like a bright ball with a few rays, but in reality there's actually a really nice array of different light shades shown there and it's all a very smooth gradient and that just isn't something that you get in SDR. The other aspect to consider is of course scenes where you've got predominantly dark content with some brighter elements mixed in. The backlight can't simply dim for those darker zones um, because there are 16 dimming zones and it's quite a big screen. Ideally, you'd have per pixel illumination so that the dark elements looked very deep and the brighter elements were illuminated appropriately. Unfortunately, with only 16 dimming zones, you don't get that kind of level of precision. And what actually happens is the very dark elements just look kind of flooded. They look significantly brighter than they should. On the written review, where I've actually included contrast measurements, the HDR the black level under HDR is, it's sort of, it's not particularly low. It's kind of um, significantly higher than the black level under my test settings where I'm using a much lower luminance. Ideally, the black level would be much deeper than that, but just for the sort of deep elements. Uh, unfortunately, as I've said, the, the dimming zones are more limited than that. So you can probably see a kind of haze there and it might even be sort of exaggerated a bit in the video, but. I can really see, if you're sitting in a dark room, you can see a spotlighting effect. You can actually see the sort of these dimming zones towards the edge of the screen. You can actually see the clusters basically illuminated with a kind of bright sort of halo effect. So it really does kind of kill the atmosphere in these really dark scenes. So I'm not particularly impressed with the sort of handling of these dark scenes in HDR on this monitor. But I don't want to end the HDR section on a sour note because I actually quite enjoy the HDR experience overall on this monitor. It was obviously very much a worst case scenario what I was showing you with the very dark elements sitting in a dark room and the camera did exaggerate the effect quite a bit. There are lots of those kind of elements on a game like this but I still enjoy using HDR over not using it. Make of that what you will. There's also something to be said for actually having more appropriate lighting in the room. You don't have to sit in a dark room for HDR. And actually this monitor has plenty of brightness for HDR. And if you have a fairly well lit room, you can still appreciate the contrast advantage and the sort of brighter elements still stand out quite nicely. Not to the extent that you'd get on a monitor with much high luminance in HDR, um, VESA Display HDR 1000 compatible display. So this is actually VESA HDR 600. I should have really mentioned that before. I definitely talk about this more in the written review, but this means that the peak luminance is only supposed to be about 600 candles per meter squared. And that's just for the brightest elements. It's not universally high because if the monitor was just universally that luminance, it would just look flooded and ridiculous and kind of slightly painful. So that's not what happens at all. Um, so I actually measured higher than that in my testing. I think it was close to 700 candles per meter squared. So it definitely has some good brightness for the brighter elements. Again, this uh, title makes good use of the color gamut and I prefer the way that colors are represented in HDR. There's some really nice vibrant shades. There's some really lush greens and the blues of those 
flowers there stand out really nicely, much nicer actually than in SDR. So the developers are definitely able to make use of this big colour gamut, but some of the greens look more muted and Lara's skin doesn't look sort of as overly tanned as it does in SDR. She just looks more as she should really. And in terms of the, the contrast, the uh, sort of reflection on those bright painted houses over there and the, the overall look of the daylight is just much more natural and appealing to me in HDR. So there's certainly a lot to be said, even though the darker elements aren't as atmospheric and deep as they should be. I'm on Battlefield 1 again, and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. There's an article on the website all about monitor responsiveness, and there's a bit of discussion in the written review about an important concept called perceived blur. This is contributed to on modern monitors, uh, modern LCDs, sample and hold monitors, mostly by your eye movement as you track motion on the screen. That creates most of the perceived blur you see, and that's tied to the refresh rate of the monitor and the frame rate that the game is running at, up to a maximum of the monitor's refresh rate. So this monitor is a 60 hertz monitor. The game is running at 60 frames a second, so I'm getting the most out of the monitor. But there's a moderate amount of perceived blur just due to the eye movement. Um, again, this isn't going to be something you can see on the video, but when you observe the monitor, or any 60 hertz monitor, this is sort of the predominant cause of blur. But there's also the pixel responsiveness to consider, and especially on VA models like this, there are some weaknesses. And the particular scene I'm using on Battlefield 1 has lots of high contrast transitions, so there are lots of darker shades with lighter shades in the background as well. And these show off some of the weaknesses on VA models like this. This model's actually not too bad in terms of its pixel responsiveness, certainly compared to some VA models I've used. So the horse here, for example, sometimes it'll have an obvious smeary trail. It'll have what I call breakup trailing. Um, although the horse looks very dark, it's not just pure black. There are various different shades in there, such as dark browns and sort of dark blues and purples. And on some VA models, you'll actually see that leach out during motion. So that's what I call breakup trailing. It's as if you're wetting a page with some water-soluble ink on it and you sort of see the ink running. It's that kind of effect. So it can be pretty eye-catching. This model doesn't really have any of that. There's a little bit of overshoot, um, sort of slightly semi-transparent trailing behind the horse, but it's really quite faint. It's not at all eye-catching. Uh, I think even users that are sensitive to overshoot won't have an issue with this model on the particular response time setting I'm using. Um, there's a bit more about the response time settings in the written review. I definitely recommend reading that if you're not sort of familiar with these. But there's not really a massive amount of uh, sort of trailing around here. A bit further down, deeper into the map, there are some slightly different transitions which you can observe. The moon here, it has a kind of a bit of a mask of additional blur to it. And um, it's sort of what I'd describe as powdery trailing, although on sort of pure whites or very bright shades like this, it kind of just, it's, it's a mask of perceived blur. It's sort of an addition to what you'd see due to eye movement, but it's not, there's not really an obnoxious, obvious trail, but there's just a bit of a mask of perceived blur, extra perceived blur there. You can also see this on the sort of light icon up there as well. And for some of the darker shades, it's actually quite a lot of what I call light powdery trailing. So that does just add a bit of a mask of extra perceived blur, but it's not extreme. And it's definitely a minor contributor compared to the perceived blur due to eye movement. There also is some breakup trailing. You can see the particular transitions here for the, the rocks there, there's actually a kind of bit of a blue trailing around it, and that is breakup trailing. But again, it's not extreme. It's not sort of an obvious extended smeary trail, but individual sensitivity to this does vary, and it's definitely there, and some users will notice this. And there are some, for some reason, VA models often struggle with the transitions around these telegraph posts with the um, very dark shades with medium shades in the background for the sky there. And this it's much like the horse, really. There's sort of a little bit of overshoot. Um, there's not really any obvious smeary trailing, though. There's a bit of a sort of, maybe I'd call it heavy powdery trailing. So there is a bit of a an extra mask of perceived blur there, but nothing extreme. I also played quite a bit of Tomb Raider on this monitor. I'm sure you 
remember that from other sections of the video. So that has plenty of dark transitions like this, but I actually found the playability just fine. There are some weaknesses as I've highlighted here. They don't really smack you in the face, they're not that kind of obvious weakness as you do get on some VA models. So the playability is pretty decent and it's really the 60Hz refresh rate that's the main barrier. If you're used to high refresh rate monitors, as I am as a reviewer, the 60Hz refresh rate and 60 frames a second, it never really feels particularly smooth, it doesn't have a great connected feel. This monitor also has quite high input lag. I measured just shy of 30 milliseconds, so it's pretty high for a monitor um, in terms of input lag. And I do feel that. I'm not massively sensitive to input lag. Um, and certainly I never feel that 60 hertz monitors really give me the sort of connected feel I like. But even then I can sort of feel a, an extra lagginess to this monitor because of the input lag. But sensitivity to that does vary. Not everyone will be bothered by it, but it is a feature of this monitor and there aren't any sort of settings you could change to improve this particular aspect either. As I mentioned in the written review, I can't accurately measure input lag with HDR enabled and that's because my reference screens don't have HDR support. So when you've got them in clone mode and you're measuring input lag, you can't actually have it enabled. Um, but to me, the input lag with HDR on feels very similar. So it's sort of quite high, but not extreme. So to wrap up the review then, the monitor's not going to win any awards in terms of its styling. It has a quite a basic office-like look to it. it. has quite thick bezels, lots of matte black plastic, a little bit of metal there, but uh, nothing particularly stylish. It also has a quite a deep stand base, so it uses quite a bit more of the depth of the desk than you might like if you have a small desk, because it is a large monitor. The screen size itself gives a nice immersive experience, and that does depend on your viewing distance, but from a kind of normal viewing distance around arm's length from the screen, it is quite immersive. And it also makes very good use of the 3840 by 2160 4K UHD resolution. I consider this screen size to be somewhat optimal for that resolution. It gives you a good amount of useful desktop real estate. You don't have to use any scaling, depending on your eyesight and your personal preferences for how things look. Or well, you might need to use a little bit of scaling, but not extreme amounts for, for most users. So that's good. The static contrast is a major strength of VA models such as this and the model did not indeed have very good static contrast. The screen surface I didn't find particularly agreeable. It was a bit grainy for my liking, um, but I've, I've definitely seen worse and it's something I'm sensitive to. It doesn't bother all users, but it's just something that I noticed and found a little bit bothersome. But as I say, users have their own preferences in that respect. As a VA panel, it also had a bit of VA glow. Nothing extreme though, um, not really very much of that to speak of and it had a moderate amount of black crush, so there were some losses of detail in dark areas because of this. In terms of the colour performance, it has a generous colour gamut, really good coverage of the DCI-P3 colour space, so things look quite vibrant overall. There were some losses of saturation towards the edges of the screen and the bottom of the screen, and they were actually a bit higher than I've seen on some modern VA models of this kind of size I've used recently, but Again, not extreme and not, not compared to the sort of shifts you'll see vertically on TN models, at least. So the overall colour output and in terms of how it's calibrated as well, it is quite vibrant and there are, there are plenty of options in the OSD to tweak things like gamma as well. The monitor also supports HDR, high dynamic range, and it has an effective local dimming solution. The HDR performance was mostly good and certainly if you're viewing it in a lighter room, you can definitely notice the sort of highlights, the brighter elements stand out really nicely. And because of the local dimming solution of the backlight, that doesn't just give a universally flooded look to the screen like your sort of typical display HDR 400 display. The local dimming actually makes sure that the brighter elements themselves look bright whilst the surrounding areas look dimmer rather than completely flooded and washed out. So I actually really like that sort of aspect of the HDR. I enjoyed using the monitor in HDR. I felt it added good depth and then sort of extra layer to the experience on games like Tomb Raider and indeed Battlefield 1. The HDR performance certainly wasn't perfect though. The performance in the dark room was not very good. If you view predominantly darker shades, you can see that the black depth isn't exactly excellent. And you can see a kind of spotlighting effect towards the corners of the screen, a bit of backlight bleed with the sort of shape of the LED clusters actually visible. 
Um, it only has 16 dimming zones, which for a screen of this size isn't exactly amazing, and that's sort of one of the reasons why the, the black depth and the overall sort of atmosphere in the dark scenes, it was uh, not exactly great. But uh, as I say, overall, the HDR experience it still offers quite a, quite a nice sort of edge to the experience over using standard SDR. It also allows it to map the very large colour gamut correctly, and it employs 10-bit precision with the game specifically coded to sort of make use of that precision. So there's definitely advantages to HDR, and as far as HDR goes on monitors, this has a, a pretty decent implementation. Responsiveness of the monitor, largely good for the panel type. There was quite a high level of input lag, which will bother some users. There were some weaknesses in pixel responsiveness, but nothing extreme for the panel type. And actually, I felt the sort of overall playability um, and the pixel responsiveness was quite good. There are various different settings you can use for pixel responsiveness, but I explore these more in the written review, and I definitely would recommend just sticking to the fast mode. So that's all there is to the Philips Brilliance 328 P6 VUBREB, or VUBREB as I call it for some reason. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.